Thank you very much, Daniel. It's an honor to be here and to follow you on this platform. But I have to admit, I am definitely a little uneasy up here with all of you truth tellers in the room. I'm just hoping that the spotlight doesn't get turned on me today because there's a whole lot of truth to tell. <laughs> Moving right along. Now, since it turns out, and I didn't expect this, that uh, there was going to be some hammering of former presidents, ladies and gentlemen, there's a story uh, that is out there uh, that early in President Bush's first term, in response to the emerging stories that were unfolding in the deserts in Darfur, President Bush's aides wrote him a memo about lessons from the Rwandan genocide. The next day, his aides received the memo back with a very powerful note attached in block letters saying simply, not on my watch. The aides came to see the president to seek clarification on which policy tools he might wish to utilize to sort of make good on this solemn pledge that he had made in, this in his uh, little handwriting. But the president quickly realized that they had misunderstood his memo. No, no, he told them. What I meant was, don't put memos on top of my watch. <laughs> Sorry. There is no such ambiguity with our honoree today, Aisha al-Basri. <clears throat> During the last dozen years, Darfur's agony has had few parallels globally. Though the terminology applying to this particular set of crimes that are unfolding there has been hotly disputed, the fact that massive numbers of people have been targeted for elimination or physical displacement purely on the basis of their identity means that it is highly likely that genocide has been committed in Darfur. Amazingly, in response to this set of atrocities that have unfolded there half a world away, there was a massive outpouring of citizen solidarity across the world, perhaps unprecedented for a complex African emergency. And after succeeding in garnering the attention of policymakers around the world. This nascent anti-genocide movement helped press successfully for the largest peacekeeping force in the world to be deployed to Darfur. The people in the streets and the churches and the synagogues and campuses trusted that this peacekeeping mission was being, was being sent to protect the people of Darfur. There was a huge demand for this United Nations mission in the belief that the UN would uphold some of its central reasons for its existence, born in the aftermath of the Great War and the Holocaust. But far more importantly, the survivors of Darfur's atrocities trusted the United Nations to come and at least try to fulfill its mandate and aspirations. The Darfuri peoples put their hope into this UN mission to end or at least ameliorate their suffering. This hope has melted away into the sands of the Sahara, largely in silence. But because of one woman and her whistle, one lone upstander in the UN bureaucracy, now the world has been alerted to the UN's complicity in the extinguishing of the hopes of Darfur's people. This courageous woman with a whistle, of course, has her own story behind why she was so strongly motivated to counter the tragic mendacity of the UN mission in Darfur. And we heard a little earlier about how her father was lied to in an earlier war and the impact that had on her. But over time, Aisha developed an aver aversion herself to war and a strong desire to serve peace. So she eventually went to work for the United Nations. But sadly, like her father, Aisha was lied to as she joined the United Nations mission in Darfur. She came to recognize the UN's role in a deliberate and a systematic cover-up of mass atrocities, a total betrayal of the founding principles of the UN. If my dear friend Samantha Power were to write a sequel to her Pulitzer Prize winning book about upstanders in the face of genocide, a problem from hell, I have absolutely no doubt that the most important next chapter would be about the upstander we are honoring today, Aisha al-Basri. Thank you.